Okay, we're live. Okie dokie, and we are live with nobody here yet, so let's wait until some people join, yes? We should do that. Uh, and then we can say hi again. Um, we're here, nobody else is here except us, and the questions are there. Uh, let's wait for some people to join us. Welcome once again to live stream round three. Uh, <clears throat> oh, we don't get to see ourselves doing it? or No. Just have to press play. Yeah, because I like that. Uh, watching now. Nobody is watching now, but we are live. Okay. Hey. hey! All right, we are we are back um, for round three. I don't know if you've just joined us or if you've been here before. Um, it's nice to see you, whoever you are, even though I can't see you. And go ahead, ask us any questions about, well, the Great War Project, last regular episode ended today, about our World War II Project, about the Time Ghost Project, about our personal lives, about our goals, our dreams, and our hopes. Go for it. This is a travesty. I'm the World War One guy. Can't I be the World War Two guy thing? Oh, and by the way, the whoever's thinking about the fly swatter spanking thing, it was a spatula, not a fly swatter. Um, two handsome history men. Yep, that's us. Captain Wealthy Penis. That is one interesting handle. Why did you do that? Have we listened to one by Metallica? Thank you, Stephen Giles. Very sad last episode. I thought so too. It was really hard to say that last line to say. I'm in Denied Dell. That was the Great War. You can hear it. I'm a little shaky. It was really hard to say that without breaking up after all. Yeah, after all those episodes. Um, and following up on that, you we've gotten that question quite a lot. If Flo and the rest of the World War II team, one team is going to move to the World War II team, it will not move to the World War II team, but we hope that we will be able to work with them once they move on to the next thing that they're going to do after uh, the Great War. We definitely want to work with Tony, Flo, Marcus, Julian, and Future. I mean, they're great. They're great at what they do. I mean, the Great War was, you know, part, big part of its success was because of them. Somebody just asked if, if it went beyond what I ever envisioned. Yeah, from the beginning, I didn't think I didn't think it would be. I thought it would be canceled before it was finished. Really, I didn't think they were going to keep financing it for for four years because it was an expensive show to, with all the all the stuff and all the crew and stuff. But they did, and it started making money after a year or so, and then it kept going. So how does that affect World War II? Aim big. Obviously. We want to aim bigger, you know? Did any of our ancestors fight the war that we know of? Well, the, we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Astrid talked about that. Indy and I did not talk about it. Obviously, my ancestors, me being of Swedish origin, I'm not very Swedish, but I'm of Swedish origin, they did not really fight in the war, but my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, he was young at the time, and uh, he was stationed on the Norwegian front. And that was one of the most fascinating discussions I had when I was a kid. Because I kept on asking him, so what side were you on? And he kept on saying, well, we were neutral. And I said, so who were, you were fire who were you firing on? And he said, well, we fired on whoever wanted to get across the border. And I said, well, who wanted to get across the border then? Of course, I was young and I was trying to make a point, but he said, well, uh, the Norwegian partisans. And I said, so you were on the German side. And he said, no, we were not. I yeah. said, well, well, you fired on the Norwegians. Why didn't you fire on the Germans? He said, well, they weren't trying to cross, the, trying border. To cross the border. <laughs> but, like, but okay, who was firing on the partisans from behind? Is it the Germans? So you were helping the Germans. He said, no, we were just protecting the Swedish border. And that's how absurd World War II was. My, uh, my mother's father, my grandfather, Grandpa Ray, uh, he fought uh, with the Royal Air Force. He was uh, he was English. Fought with the Royal Air Force in North Africa. Um, people have asked so much over the the last few years if any of my family fought in the First World War, and I didn't know specifically of anything about that until okay last year. So this would be last November. I was in Houston where I grew up and where my parents live, and I was talking to my dad uh, about something or other, and he said, "Hey, you know." Um, on his his family is, is from the Russian Empire, both sides going back, and it turned out that um, his mother's father, uh, his name was Aaron Dermansky, and actually he's the guy that designed the American uniform buttons in World War II for the American uniforms. Really? Yeah, my 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 great grandfather, but he did not fight in the First World War. However, he had five brothers who did fight with the Russian army in the First World War, and they were all officers, and they all died. And my dad told me this last year, 2017. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me this in 2014 when I started the Great War? He goes, well, do you find it interesting? I'm like, what, 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 what kind of question? Why would I not find it interesting? <laughs> so, I, it's, it's just going to move around. 
Um, well, did An India's ancestors fight in the Civil War? Absolutely. Well, not the American Civil War, maybe the Russian Civil War, but none of my ancestors lived in the United States until the early 20th centuries. Uh, none of the four branches of my grandparents lived there. Uh, let's see. Uh, you guys should make a World War One video game? Eh, maybe. Uh, oh, you've got the questions there. What was the most expensive episode you ever made? Uh, with For the Great War, it would have definitely be something that was on the road. Probably the stuff we shot in Gallipoli because of the flights and the hotels and stuff. But uh, uh, really, we had a great benefactor, uh, uh, a Turkish gentleman named Ali Serim, who who loves to support history. And he's actually the main supporter of our friend John's channel, uh, The Ottomans in World War One. He paid for that trip for the Great War crew to come down and shoot those ep extra episodes in Gallipoli, which was really cool. So those were the most expensive, but we didn't actually have to pay for it. Um, wait, you are Russian? No, I'm not Russian, but some branches of my family are Russian. Um, what do I think is the most misunderstood aspect of World War II? Um, well, we did... If you look up on the Great War Channel, uh, I mean, was it World War Two or World War One? Most misunderstood aspect of World War Two. That's going to be hard to say until I finished writing the show. Um, you know, I, I haven't gone in depth in say 1943 as much as I have in 1939, so I don't think I can really answer that. Do you have some uh, Patreon questions? Um, I have a question here for us, and that is from Sota Historia Aikikanawa. I I hope I pronounced that somewhere close to the correct way. Some people ask me why I am interested in such a disturbing and horrible event when I'm talking about World War II. How would you answer that question? You mean because uh, it's an event in which millions of people died, you should not be interested in it or not want to remember that? That's That should be self-evident. Of course you're interested in it. You To not know your history, we said this earlier today, people say, oh, you got to know your history. That's not true. You should know your history, and you should know his history, and her history, and other people's history. The history of Brazil, the history of what's Zimbabwe now. These are actually all relevant to the world that we, where you can learn so much from any of these histories. Uh, I think it's, it's foolish to focus on just one thing to the exclusion of others, but anything where millions and millions of people died cannot help but shape the world we live in. Definitely research the Thirty Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars, the Black Death, Justinian's Plague. These are, and it these doesn't are just important. have to be wars. Stella Starr just asked, are you going to do any videos about internal problems in Germany after the war? Yes, we, we already are. Have. We already have. We've, we've covered that in between two wars. We recommend you watching that. It's, it's definitely... The whole process of history is a process of learning. Um, and not just studying history, but I mean, think about it. Why are we today sitting here in a country, which happens to be Germany, which is today democratic, one of the most liberal, and I don't mean liberal in, in left-right politics, I mean liberal in the viewpoint of history, um, that is to say democratic, open, and tolerant of what the societies of the, of, in the world. Well, we're sitting here because millions of people sacrifice their lives in order to get there. And if we don't remember that, then we might actually forget everything that they died for. And, and so the reason to be interested in this, beyond the morbid fascination that every one of us has with action and, and murder and whatnot, that's why we watch like crime scene, crime stories and what things like that. Beyond that, it's actually, it's, it's our damned responsibility to take interest in these things. Well, also think of it this way. If people go, oh, I'm not interested in history. Yeah, yeah, you are. If you use the internet, you're interested in history because the internet is built on other forms of communication. That's how humanity works. That's how we work in technology. It's how we work in culture. That's how we work in art and music. You make something based on what has gone before. And certainly, look, look at the, look at, we have a longer life expectancy because we can fight disease better than we could 50 years ago, 100 years ago, because we've learned a great deal by building on that history. So if someone says they're not interested in history, they're lying to you. They're not maybe consciously and directly interested in history, but everything they do is based on their history. So they can't help but be interested in it. Um, and that leads to a question from Dora Faust. Hi, Dora. Hi, Dora. Uh, what do you think is the biggest lesson World War I taught you personally? Uh, that could be quite a meta question because it could be the biggest thing it taught me personally about the actual war because it also taught me an awful lot about how to do a YouTube channel, 
which, you know, that's a different thing entirely. Um, well, it certainly corrected a lot of misapprehensions, not so much that I had, but definitely that so many people had. Should I close the window or we want it open? No, we want it open because it's okay. going to get too warm. Um, certainly, I mean, the big one for most people, you know, that this was a European war, that it was not a world war. And that... Even though, you know, I knew there was an Eastern Front and a Western Front and an Italian Front, and I knew there was Gallipoli and stuff, but those places are all, uh, they're all in Europe. But it was by no means a European war. It was a massive global conflict. And I didn't realize the scale of its globality until I really started, you know, writing it, doing the research and writing for it, of course. Um, in terms of things outside the war that I learned from the war, I certainly learned very well how to construct... I'll call it pocket historical documentaries because each episode of the Great War, whatever week it is, if you watch it, you're not going to, you shouldn't be confused. You shouldn't go, I don't know what's been going on. I have no idea. It should stand for itself with a hook, a conclusion, summaries and recaps and all the different parts and stuff. But you should be able to just jump in anywhere and join the series and maybe go back and then watch the stuff before. I definitely learned how to write very concise very pointed historical essays. Sure. And uh, just as a short aside, because I don't have time to answer it in written, uh, Docs from Israel asked us if we would be interested in getting a, um, a link to a uh, newly found, uh, recently discovered Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass photos, and the answer is yes, please. We really want to get access to that. I, I need as much resources as possible. Please write us an email at community at timegoes.tv or get on to the uh, Time Goes Army community page and, and give, us a, a, give us the link. We'd, we'd love it. So <clears throat> now I'm going to answer this first and then you answer the second, uh, the next question. Okay. Arch Stanton asks us, which historical event do you feel deserves more attention? I'm going to say that I think Pex Romana the Roman peace okay. that started with um, with uh, Augustus uh, and went on way beyond his death, 123 years. I think it was a little bit more. I don't remember off the bat of my head now, but it was it was over a century of peace in the Mediterranean region, the longest period of peace that we've ever seen, actually, in the history of mankind. And there's a lot to be learned from how he managed... Uh, how he managed Rome at the time and the legacy that he left behind when it comes to um, actually things like tolerance, when it comes to things like fairness, uh, fighting corruption, where you can really learn that already 2,000 years ago there were some people who had understood that the driving forces behind, uh, be behind conflict are largely things like corruption and, and intolerance and, and oppression. And that is... Pretty ironic, because he was also one of the most successful warriors of his time, and he was pretty aggressive in the beginning of his his uh, reign in in slapping down well, both rebellions. Turning the second whatnot. triumvirate into the Roman Empire. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, he was a he was a warrior prince in many ways, yeah. but he was a warrior prince who turned around once he had done that, consolidated things that did not put it under his heel, no. and instead he implemented policies that created lasting peace way after his, his death. So that deserves more 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 uh, focus than it gets today because we can learn a lot from that. And what would I say? I suppose I would probably say the Black Death, actually. Um, you know, much like the way a lot of people view the First World War, which they view as a European war, although it was, in fact, an entirely global conflict, <laughs> people view the Black Death as something that happened in Europe when it was... Okay, not so much to North and North and South America, but the rest of the societies that knew each other from China all the way to Western Europe. I mean, the plague, the plague Baxillus is native to the steppes of Central Asia. Um, there's more figures because Pope Clement VI and people kept a lot more, were able to do a lot more with the ecclesiastical registers and see how many people died. And from a European population of roughly 78 million people, 23 million people died. That's a hell of a lot of people. That's more than a quarter. That's getting close. That's, you know, you're looking up the 30% of the people. It's fairly safe to assume that at least that many people died in the Middle East, in India, in China, in all of those places. Now, 
my thesis at university was the immediate post-plague era, how that enormous societal change paved the way for a reformation that could not have happened without the effect of the Black Death. And without the reformation happening when it happened, obviously think of everything that went after that. All of, well, the war is sure, but the, the, the breaking of what in many ways, and no offense to any Catholics, was a stranglehold of the Catholic Church on, on Europe. Uh, the change was not quite as profound in the Middle East and in China. The imperial structures still remained. Um, well, okay, the, the Ottoman Empire hadn't taken, hadn't really grown, hadn't started, hadn't taken Constantinople and things like that by then. But that was, uh, I think, we, there's a great deal we can learn from the plague. There's a book by uh, William McNeil called The Human Condition, which argues that more so than warfare, that disease has been the great driver of social, cultural, and technological change in Europe, and even little things. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the first English sanitation laws were enacted after Richard the Raker fell through an outhouse and drowned in 1351 during the plague because people connected sanitation with the Black Death, with Ursima pestis, with the fleas, and with the black rats. And, of course, the black rat was extinct, uh, went extinct in the late 1600s, and that's when you stopped having plague outbreaks in Europe. You know, the last ma the last major ish one was in Marseille in 1720. But, yeah, you, the, the amount of change was absolutely colossal. Uh, our world would have looked so, so different. Who can say if there would have been something like a Reformation, but definitely this Reformation that we had was not possible without without the Black Death. So, like, yeah, the Horseless uh, asked us a few minutes ago uh, if we are going to cover the Turkish independence struggle yep. and the civil war, the Russian civil war. And yes, we are. We have already covered the Russian civil war in between two wars, and in the next couple of weeks, we're coming out with a ma mammoth episode it's on the Great Times Turkish as long, war. Three times as long as the regular <clears throat> between, two episode, between Two Wars episode. Because it's tricky. We have to do justice to all sides without pointing fingers, to, t and it's really tough to pre present that. I think I think we did a really good job. I'm very curious to see what, like, John and Ali and our Turkish friends and our Greek friends think, think of that. When we and we, that. we did that one. We I've, it would not have been able to do it without the help from uh, Jonas and Valentis, who, who uh, helped me research that from the viewpoint of the Turkish side. Yona, Jonas gave me that, and Valentis gave me the Greek view of it. Otherwise... I would never have been able to read that, uh, write that episode because it's so hard to research that because of all the fogs that have been pulled over it for political reasons. Yeah. And having you guys in the community help us to burst through these kinds of fogs is an essential bit of, of, of why we want to work more and more with you. Uh, I'm now, at, we I'm have sorry. a patron waiting to Skype with us. Okay, let me answer two quick questions. One, Tempranillo, that's what wine we're drinking, and two, Przemysl. Somebody wanted to hear me say that. Good. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to try to set up the Skype call. Uh, do we have a handle, uh, uh, Yoram? Okay. Well, yeah. This is the first one we've done like this today. You know. Okay. Will we make videos with military history visualized? We'd like to, hopefully. For some reason, my mouse is not going where it should be because I'm holding it upside down. Okay. There How would you recommend uh, catching up on the Great War? I. I would w I would recommend watching all the regular episodes from beginning to end. If you don't have the time, of course, we have the whole series of recap specials, but that can't possibly convey the entire story to you. I mean, the regular episodes are around 10 minutes each, 9, 10 minutes, so a month is 40 minutes. So, you know, it's not that long to watch four years if you really think about it. You can do it over a period of a few weeks. Do I have some more there? How many languages do I speak? Uh, fluently, fluently, I speak English and Swedish. I speak bits and pieces of other languages just from having lived in other countries. So, um, and I speak four languages fluently. Two of them are my, my first languages or my mother tongue, that's Swedish and English. And then I speak pretty much fluent, almost native German and French. Are we going to do something about the Chinese power struggle within or after the First World War? Well, we did a whole special on the Great War. Here comes the Skype thing. It's going to be noisy, too. Which, which, which camera am I supposed to look at? Still look at this one. Okay, so who's the guy we're talking to? Uh, hello, Roni? Hello. Yeah, it's Ron. Hi, Ron. How are you? Hi, Ron. Nice to have you on the show tonight. 
We're gonna. Uh, you have. Uh, you want to stay on audio? Uh, hi, uh, hi, everyone. You're very. He's very loud. Should he turn down his mic? No, no. I, I, I'm gonna do it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll turn down a little bit. Yeah, no, no, don't worry about it. I've done it. Sparty's yeah. done it. Okay. So, well, great to have you aboard. Where, where are you? Uh, so I'm in England right now, just outside of Cambridge. Okay. Um, I will say I moved to England about 2016. Okay. And I was bored out of my mind waiting to start work and discovered the Great War. And I'm really glad I did because moving over here, I didn't know the impact that the war had, had over here. You know, being an American, World War One is not as much you no, know, no. in the collective consciousness as it is over here. So I really appreciated getting to know the impact from your channel. So thank you guys for that. You know, it's funny. When, when, if you look back at some of the comments from the very first few Great War episodes when we started it, we get like people writing in, why is a Yank presenting this? And my answer is, because it's my idea, you know. <laughs> but the people were really, they're like, because, well, America joined you know, so late in the war. And so like, no, you are not qualified to present this this show. Well, I mean, think about it. It's ironic. Uh, when we started that show, the people behind the show, one was German. Uh, she might have had a justified, you know, reason to, to do something about it. I'm originally Swedish. We had nothing to do with the whole thing because we stayed out of the conflict. And you're the only one, actually, who could, like, you know, uh, have a claim to having, like, a traditionally just cause for telling this story. But that's based on the idea that only the victors can tell the story. That's not right. And only people who weren't involved. Not at all. You can, you know, this is, this was a global conflict. Everyone was affected. I mean, I know that, I mean, I'll look at my family who obviously was not both my parents are Swedish so they were not involved in the war in any way my my, my great-grandfather and my grandfather my grandfather was born in 1899 so he was young and my grandmother was born in 1910 and she had siblings who actually got rachitis during the war because they didn't get enough food to Sweden so they were suffering from rickets yeah, rickets, yeah. yeah. okay so they got rickets and so, I mean, the whole globe was affected. Well, oddly enough, though, um, all four branches, you know, if you go through my parents, both of their parents, all four branches of them lived in, in the warring nations uh, during the First World War. So, you know, there were no Yanks in my family at the time. Um, and yeah. Astrid's father was actually born, believe it or not. He was born the year before the war. And he was a, um, he lived in Silesia. Uh, and on the border to Posen. Uh, those were parts of the lands that were ceded to Poland right afterwards. And when he was seven years old, they were forced to, to um, abandon what then became Poland. Uh, now, Ron, do you have any specific questions for us? Or are you just calling to say hi? Or uh, I mean, hi. And by the way, my parents met at Cambridge. Oh, wow. Um, I actually found out that my grandfather, who... Um, it was from South Africa, actually uh, attended uh, university up here, and I didn't know that until I moved here. Uh, but actually, one of my uh, questions would be, uh, one of the things you guys did, which I really enjoyed, was prominent figures in World War II and World War I. Uh -huh. so my question for you is, are you going to do the converse for World War II? For instance, uh, the Kaiser is still alive until 1941. What's going on with him during this period? Just as an example. Actually, I'd say here's something I know that's going on with him. Until he died, living in the Netherlands, once the Second World War began, he had a map that he would put pins in to follow the German advances and stuff. This, he did this until he died. Uh, I can't say how we're going to cover World War I figures in World War II. It would be nice to, but obviously when we start the biography stuff, which will start soon, uh, sometime in the beginning of the new year is when it's going to start, yeah? Possibly December even. Possibly December even. Um, um, we'll have to start, obviously, with World War II figures in World War II. And there's a lot of them. It would be nice to cover World War I figures, what they did in World War II. I think that will be more covered in whatever the out-of-the-trenches version of World War II is, in, like, out-of-the-foxholes, or in a, an out-of-the-ether sort of thing, or off the, you know, off the radio waves, or whatever we call it. We shouldn't forget, either, that a lot of the generals, uh, both on the German side and on the Allied side, uh, were junior officers in World War I. So, 
you know, a very, very large portion of the military leadership on both sides were already active in World War I. So, you know, it kind of gets to the point where we have to cover more or less every single, like, major general. So somebody wrote in, are we going to cover Philippe Piton? Yes, we're going to. He had a major role in the Second World War. That's not like a guy in the First World War. Like, the Kaiser didn't have a major role in the, in the Second World War. I think, so. Ron, to get back to your question and, and to see why, like, the kind of the difference, without saying that we won't, is that the difference is that when Indy was writing the Great War, uh, the characters that would later fight World War II, it was, they were not major characters of World War I, so it was a little bit astonishing. Uh, I mean, if you take Mussolini, who did have a major part in World War I, uh, in some ways, but it, it was not clear that he was going to be the leader of a nation at that point. Certainly uh, Churchill had a major part in World War I. Sure, you know, we but, but about you know, many of the ones that were covered in World War I, it wasn't clear at that point, while as the reverse... It becomes a little bit more obvious, if you see what I mean. Absolutely. Um, thank you guys for your time. Sure. So uh, what, let me just ask you some, something else you know, out of interest. What do you do in Cambridge? Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a contractor for the U.S. military. Oh, cool. So the day. Jinx. <laughs> I'm not going to let you jinx me. Okay. Wow. Well, I mean... Uh, I'm going to say that without being American. Uh, you know, it's a great thing that you're supporting the services. Can I answer this question somebody's just written? Can we okay, take a well, moment? Uh, Sorry. Ron, uh, did you have anything else? Or Nope. Thank you guys for your time and really enjoy everything you no, guys have done. Thanks for calling in. So. It's nice thanks for calling in. It's great. We need all the patrons we can because, again, we've said it many times, but you guys don't realize without Patreon, without even the $1 a month and stuff that people pledge, this show would not exist. A guy just wrote in saying, how come he didn't wait until next September? So it's 80 years since... What would I, I'd have to get a job before then, after the Great War. I'd have to do something else for, for money. And then I'd be doing that. There would be no World War II project if we waited until September 2019. And also, let's be clear. If we did this 79 years later, 80 years later, 43 years later... 216 and a half years later, it shouldn't make any difference. I mean, with the Great War, 100, yeah, it's a nice round number. But this show follows the war chronologically. It would be exactly the same show if we did it 89 years later or 42 years later. It doesn't change what the actual show is. And even the 100 years thing was not that big a deal to the success of the Great War, as it turned out. When there were big anniversaries, the 100th anniversary of things, we didn't get a huge bump in subscribers, like which we imagined we would. That wasn't a big deal. So 79, 80 years, it's just, it's the same show. That's what I'll say. Um, I forgot what I, the guy asked the question that I was going to ask, and I forgot. Oh, yeah. The so guy said and, it hadn't and, aged and in four years. Wait, wait, just a moment. We still have Ron on the line. Oh, I thought he was gone. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no Sorry, still Ron. There. Ron, uh, Ron, but on that note, right I, 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 I wanted to say... If questions as possible, I'll still be watching. Cool, and, and thank you so much for your support. With everything that Indy said, just can't underscore that enough. Your support is vital, and we're happy to have you on board. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, Ron. Maybe we'll meet you when we're in when we're in England. Yep. Oh, this guy's OCD cannot tolerate our incompetence. Then why are you here? Why are you online? Don't torture yourself like that. Uh, let's see. So Dora Faust yeah. says, going back to language knowledge, would you like us fans to help translate the videos to specific languages or any sources you need for writing episodes that are not available in one you understand? Esperanto. So... Um, okay, uh, this is this is a really really important question, Dora, and it's one that we're struggling a little bit with. Um, we have the goal, and the goal is to get you guys more involved and just do that over the Time Ghost Army community. And I mean, it's just so difficult to get it set up in a systematic way, and it takes a lot of time. So we're working continuously on getting to do that. And this week, in the end. Uh, Yorama both here, so hopefully we're going to make some progress on that level. But the answer is actually mm, yes, a resounding yes. Uh, our goal here with what we're doing with Time Goes was from the very get-go is to take the whole like interactive and um, 
community-based effort one step or ten steps further because I mean, this again, it goes back to why did we not want to do this with a network or why did we want to do this independently? You know, the motivation that comes from, from Astrid, Indy, and myself to do these things, and hopefully we can get Yoram on board as well with that motivation, but the motivation that we have to do is, is there's so much passion behind us it, or in us that, that we need to get out. And when somebody breaks that down and says, okay, like, we're not going to do this uh, because this reason or that reason, or no, 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 you don't deal with that. We're going to put an employee on that. That passion goes lost. So that is why we're, we're, we're here and we're independent today, because we want to make sure that we're on top of that kind of thing uh, and take that whole community effort to the next step. And we're going you to start talk about the treasure hunt. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So, so one of the first things that we're setting up now is that we're going to do a treasure hunt and the treasure hunt is going to be a way for us to, motivate people to take part in actually searching for material in our archive or outside of the archive to improve the quality of our images inside of the well, picture. Well, hang on, you the, haven't explained the, to them. The, 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 the One of the thing. most time-consuming things about the writing and the editing of this is not putting the putting the pictures in or putting the films in or right. It's finding the right material in the archives that fits with what I'm talking about. And you need a historian not just a social media person, not just a hired intern. You need someone that knows what they're talking about. If we can have help with that, then that can free Sparty, me, and Joram up to do a lot more stuff like the Between Two Wars stuff, like get started on Korean War, like do more of the baseball stuff. So this is a big deal, the treasure hunt. Uh, I'm not certain what kind of rewards we'll have for it, but there are going to have to be some rewards. Yes, there is. We're going to get points for the stuff that you used and whatnot. So we're going we're gonna, to, it's going to be a fun thing as well, because that's also important. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, we've, we've been talking a lot, an amazing amount of uh, how important this is on a serious level, lest we forget and all of those things. But there's another side to this. We do this because it's fun as well. And yeah, we, we, you know, most fun thing I've ever and, done. And, and, and we want to keep it fun, both for you and for us. That's a really, really important part. I mean, what we do is very much, uh, you know, it's it's 30% responsibility or 33% responsibility, 33% um, historical interest and 33% fun. You know, that's the, yeah. that, so, so we're going we're gonna to try to get that up. And, you know, we want to create a community of people that think that it's fun, worthwhile, and interesting to deal with history. And let's face it, it is fun to dig around through like the Reuters archive and look through all the... That's like, you'll be looking for something by ne Neville Chamberlain did, but you'll spend three hours going off on other tangents because there's so much cool stuff. It's so much fun to go through. I wish I had a, that luxury. See, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that poor, poor guy. Um, can, I, can I do a tangent and answer one question the guy's written like five sure. times? Sure. He said, what about Romania? Are we going to cover Romania in World War One or World War Two? Well, in war, in the Great War, all you have to do is go back to the 1916 episodes. I talked about Romania in and out every single week for like six months. And then again in the summer of 1917, 2017. So there's not going to be any more talk about Romania on the Great War. There will be some referrals to Romania as, as it pertains especially to with deal with Hungary in the post-war stuff. In World War II, yes, we're going to talk about Romania and the Balkans and the Baltics. You don't need to ask if we're going to leave out a specific country. It's a world war. We're going to cover every every part of the world war. We're not going to leave out China. We should leave out the U.S. That'd be funny. Yeah, who needs <laughs> this, the U.S.? We, we should pick some country. We should pick, hey, like, just not talk about Italy in, at all. In 1938, then, nobody felt in the U.S. felt they needed the, we needed the U.S. So why should go. we why should we not ignore them going forward? All right, good yeah. point. So, and Indiana Jones, hi Indiana, love your comments. Wrote that he that that uh, our videos is the highlight of his days. Indiana, your comments are the highlight of our days. We love you. Keep up the good work. Um, what do I think about Finland in World War II? Actually, you know that's it's funny because. Since we try to be fairly even-handed with the hooks and the conclusions for each thing, uh, with both the Great War and World War II, you know, I don't say, hey, I don't think these guys did great and these guys sucked. I might imply stupidity in places or imply genius in places, sure. But there is one of the conclusions, one of the last lines I say in one of the December episodes actually is, way to go, Finland, because you couldn't help but say it that week, whoever you are. 
So what do I think about Finland in, in, in the Winter War and World War II? I think Finland did something truly, truly remarkable, not just in the war, and not just in the 20th century, but in all-time military history. I think Finland did one of the most remarkable things. And so. uh, playing around, uh, well, first of all, Alexander Goodman asks, how much wine did you both have till now, if I may ask? Uh, this is my third glass of the day, but my but the, the first one was like five hours ago. That's I'm going to have my, another in a second. That's my third glass of the day, and mine was only an hour ago. So, What uh, about Luxembourg? Tell them the hashtag again. Yeah, what about Luxembourg? We're only going to do it when, once that hashtag... There you go. Somebody put hashtag, hashtag mention, mention Luxembourg. Luxembourg. Mention if, you Luxembourg. Get that, if you get that to trend on some social platform somewhere, we will mention Luxembourg on the, until then. Sorry, you guys are out of the war. Hashtag mention Luxembourg. Uh, hey, playing are around you... asks us a question that has to do with playing around. Okay. Asks us a question that has to do with what do you think of other people and how smoothly do you all get on? Surely with all the time and perhaps pressure you all have together, sometimes there's a little strain. Well, first of all, don't call me Shirley. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Uh, second of all, um, you know... Sparty and I are colleagues, and with Astrid as well, and have been colleagues for years, but Sparty and Astrid are married, and so they get along just like married couples do, which is not at all, no, they get along most of the time. <laughs> uh, but Sparty and I have been friends for, for uh, since the 90s. Um, we were friends and planned different projects before we started working different projects. We disagree on things, but those are more minutiae. The actual... The actual... The actual goal and the direction of the channel, while we'll have arguments about it, they're not like, nah, I don't want to talk to that guy anymore arguments, at least not so far. I mean, you can ask me again in another five years and stuff. Uh, uh, I, I can add a little bit of, I mean, this goes back to the whole thing, like our independence and whatnot. There was a moment in time when the whole media craft thing put a little bit of a strain on our relationship, simply because oh, yeah. we were all um, under pressure. That's true. And, and, and that was a real... It was, it was a real pisser, to put it in pure English, because we were, at the end of the day, all three of us were victims of the same problem, yeah. and it's hard to not take that out on each other, but even things like that, you know, we get over it, we move on, we're, we're, we're more than colleagues, we're, we're, you know, the best of friends, so that's the... A week from now is going to be a stream where it's just me, and people will say, what happened to Spartacus? I'll say, he's dead to me. <laughs> Which will be a sad moment for you. What do I think of Simo <laughs> Hey Hey? I, uh, I, I've seen you post it a couple of times there, don't worry. I think, again, like the Finnish story in general, his story is remarkable. There will, there will be a bio special on him this winter sometime. It'll probably be one of our first bio specials, I can guarantee that, because it's definitely a story that needs to be told. And it makes such topical sense during the Winter War. And... Even some of our little collaborations, like we've been talking to the Tank Museum in Bobbington, because they have a T-26 uh, with tanks that were used during the Winter War and were also used in the early stage. The Chinese used them during the uh, Sino-Japanese War. So they're going to do sometime, hopefully in December, January, a special about the T-26 tank. Again, we have to work out how the revenue sharing and how the archival things work. That's not so much of a problem with the Tank Museum, because they have so much footage of their own. But uh, it, it's a little trickier with the bio projects. So somebody asked me, uh, no, I did not create the Spartacus League. Somebody asked who I am, uh, and I guess that's a justified question because I'm not usually that much in front of the camera. That might change in the future, though, because I might have to, or I want to, cover some of the stuff that we're going to do in World War II. And I I'm might quit. You might not. Yeah, I might not. <laughs> that's, so uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, really briefly, um, uh, like Indy said, we go back a very, very long time. We came up with the idea for world for the Great War together. I used to be the CEO of MediaCraft at the time, so I was running that company. And I'd founded that together with my wife, Astrid, who produced the Great War for two years. Well, I co-produced it as well. It's more executive production, yeah, but still. But, but nevertheless. And Indy um, did the Great War. He did that more or less on all his own, all on his own together with the team of the Great War, Flo, and all of the guys, of course. Um, and uh, I now write all of the stuff for Between Two Wars. Uh, I've written The Cuban Missile Crisis and um, will continue working with Indy also on the creative side to write more things for World War II once I don't have to edit it 
I also edited all of the ep- or edited all the episode until a couple of weeks ago Recently. when we started getting help from Ben yeah. and, and whatnot. So oh, and by that's the way, if you have not checked out the Cuban Missile Crisis, our mini series, it's one volume, one episode for each day of the missile crisis. So thirteen regular episodes, a couple of prologues, and a day zero. You can check that out on the Time Ghost uh, YouTube channel. It's really good. That was the first thing we did as under the under the banner of Time Ghost. Sanders21258 asked if Indy would like to comment on the recent laws about World War II in Poland. I don't know if Indy wants to comment on it, but I'd like to comment on it. Okay. Um, I think that is one of the most counterproductive things that I have seen a government in Europe do in a long, long time. Uh, obviously, I agree with the fact that the uh, death camps and the concentration camps were not Polish camps. That is not what people mean. Um, I don't think that there is any reason to talk about a Polish involvement in that Nazi atrocities. Poland was in very, very many ways one of the most victimized countries by the Nazi re- regime, if not the most victimized country by the Nazi, re- Nazi regime. Ukraine comes up there pretty high up there as well, or, or the, those parts of Russia, which later became Ukraine. Nevertheless, that is a fact. But that kind of, those kind of laws do not work in favor of the idea of making clear that it was not the Polish state or Poland that did all of this. They only serve to obscure the fact that this was a much more complex problem than we would like it to be. Sure, it was Germany who created Nazism. It was the German government who invaded Poland, who created this war. It was the German Wehrmacht who created, who did a lot of the work for the German SS. And there is no question that they were the main perpetrators of the Holocaust, of all of those things that went on. However, and I think the debate in recent days after Macron's somewhat weird uh, uh, handling of the Pétain problem shows, there was involvement of many other nationals, if not na- nations. Poland as a nation was not involved with the, the, the uh, atrocities of the Nazis, but there were Polish citizens, the so-called Volksdeutsche, who did a lot of things that were together with the Nazis. And making laws like that does not serve the purpose of making it clearer. It serves the purpose of obscuring the fact that this was a complex problem that we need to understand to the very roots and accept the fact that there is no black and white version of history here. So I don't think it's a good idea. That is the, the basic of my answer to that. That's a good answer, actually. Um, where should we go from that? Should I answer a couple of these? Uh, yes, I am single. And yes, we will do a bio special on Mannerheim. <laughs> Those were easy enough. Written well, forgot Sure, someone? I'm single. Who's asking? <laughs> uh, let's see. Those are going really fast. I scare you or he scares you? No. Kitana... Kojima scares Unicat. Oh, okay. What did Indiana Jones ask? Can, can, you, can you give me that one? I, I missed that. Indiana Jones? Yeah, just now. And Eric, I think he understood what you said. He's going to read David Glansen's book. I'm going to do it. You're going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do it. But I have no copy. You can send them to me in Spanish or in Spanish. But yeah, you're going to do it. Yeah, you're going to Dora says you are single and 15 question marks. You counted the question marks, which I think is is quite interesting. I am single. 15 exclamation points. Uh, uh, They love your suit. Where was that purchase made from? Astrid did that, of course, because Astrid is our awesome designer and his husband. Oh, no, the Swedish has started again. It never stops. What do I think was the most influential moment in history? Actually, that's a good one. Let me do mine, then you do yours. The most, hmm, for me, the most influential single moment in history was the failure of Sargon to destroy or to take Jerusalem in whatever, the 600s BC. Now, here's the thing. Not to take it, to fail to take it, because... 20 years later, it fell to his son, right? But it was during those 20 years that the, that the, the Jewish people came up with the concept of 
carrying your faith with you. Uh, until then, uh, most, most societies have been polytheistic, but even the monotheistic ones, you would live in a town and it would be your god that was protecting your town. When you left your town, if you went far away, you were actually leaving the protection of your god. The Jews came up with this concept, which was completely new, that the temple was wherever you were. You could be somewhere else, and you could still pray, and you could still communicate with your God. And this was very new. So when, uh, what's his name? Sargon's son. I, I, it starts with an S as well. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, when they did take Jerusalem, and the, the Jews ended up in the Babylonian captivity for a hundred years, Judaism did not die, which is what happened to most uh, re uh, religions when your town was taken. Your society was uh, subsumed into something else. Judaism did not die. Not only that, it spread to the captors because you could still be with your God. This was the true God. You could be with your God wherever you are. Now, because Judaism did not die, Christianity and Islam eventually developed from, uh, from as offshoots, they did, of, of Judaism. Those are the three largest religions in the world today. Whatever you think about them, for better or for worse, they have in large part guided human society for the last couple of thousand years. Well, there's the Buddhists as well, I suppose. But had, had Jerusalem fallen to Sargon, before the concept of taking the temple with you, of taking your religion with you, then there would be no Judaism, no Christianity, and no Islam. So I think that might be the most important thing that happened in human history. Okay. Um, my answer to that is going to be a little bit unexpected, perhaps, for Indy, um, because I'll answer what I think most many Americans would agree with, uh, at least Americans who are not historians, I think that the most significant moment in human history so far is the Declaration of Independence. I would not have guessed that. No, I, didn't I would not have would. chosen that either, actually. No, so. I know you did. So. Uh, and that might be biased for me because, I mean, I've spent a large portion of my life studying nationalism and studying the uh, like rise of democracy. But the Declaration of Independence, although not intended that way, we have to understand that the motivation by the Founding Fathers was a different one than what a lot of people, especially people that are now nationalistically interpreting it in, in the U.S., is a much more complex thing that had a lot less to do with nationalism and a lot more to do with individual rights. Uh -huh. But it paved the way for a... Uh, for a a chain of events that followed the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, and which eventually led to the Second World War, and it ignited the spark, or it was a spark that ignited the gases that had been rising up during in the Age of Enlightenment, and even right. before that, that were so essential in order to bring about democracy, egalitarianism, and all of the things that we take for granted today. So, uh, so I, I, I really think that that is the most important moment in human history. That's a really good one. I'm gonna have to think about that because that that wouldn't that wasn't something that automatically came to me. Uh, I'll think about. I like that. yours as well, by the way, and and I'm I'm very very partial to what you said, just so yeah. that, that I'm not. And this is a very it's always difficult to make these choices. But wait, why is this like gonna miss you, Indy? Are are you are you are you terminally ill? <laughs> I'm I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be doing World War II for spoiler alert the next five year, the next years. five and a half years. <laughs> uh, you don't have to miss me. And there's Time Ghost. We'll be doing. Well, eventually we'll be doing the Korean War, some more baseball stuff, Black Death. Don't you don't have to miss me um, unless I know you personally and you've moved away from my neighborhood and I just didn't see your neighborhood. In which case, <laughs> man, I'm gonna miss you too. <laughs> We yeah. had the question if we're pissed. If you mean the American version of pissed, definitely not. If you mean the English version of pissed, I don't think we are. No, I haven't had... It, I, I drink a great deal of wine. Uh, it takes more than three glasses of wine to get me pissed. Uh, jolly, perhaps, but pissed... Uh, yay, more indie, yay? I like that comment. That's a good comment. Send that guy a beer. Wildfire lefter. We keep on getting that comment. We certainly hope we do not have to do World War Three week by week. Uh, I did say uh, when we were streaming this morning, I don't know if any of you guys were there, but people say, are you going to cover World War Three? And I was thinking, hey, hey, 
in, say, 10 years, why don't, and we would very much need the community to start doing this, why don't we actually build a World War III that starts in the year 2128, and we're doing it 100 years beforehand in real time, week by week, in which case we not only have to pick the countries, we have to design the entire political system, the entire technology, the weapons, the military structures of these, create the battles, create the propaganda, and really build an entire world war, much like we, you know, Think of what we did with the Great War. Build that from the ground up. That would be an unbelievably cool project to do, but I'm not going to write that all by myself. I can write World War II by myself. I could write World War I by myself. I strongly doubt I could write World War III all by myself. You know? Hans the DJ asks if we covered the Polish-Soviet War on the Time Goes Channel. The answer is yes. yes. Oh, these are going a little fast for me to... Yes, an alternate history. That's an interesting one, yeah. <laughs> India's buzz... Dude, um, every time we do like the uh, the live streams with like 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 CN Arsenal and stuff, my coffee mug was always full of wine. It was the evening. We do like three hours straight. I, I loved having a few drinks, talking about history. I Some, can do that forever. Somebody know? asks, I only saw it flash by, but somebody asks, us, why are you so fascinated by wars? It's not so much that. Um, I'm not. I mean, I am now by default a military historian just because I've done. An incredibly thorough documentary on on a, on, a, on a military thing. Uh, I don't block myself as a military historian. I was never overly interested in military history in its specifics. It was more in the macro, as as it pertained to as a world war or the American Civil War, or the French Revolution pertained to other major events. I mean, some okay, the First World War at the time was still not the deadliest conflict in human history, either by percentage or total numbers. The Taiping Rebellion in China uh, from the 1850s to the 1870s killed at least 40 million people and possibly up to 100 million people in one country. Its only real influence, though, lasting influence, was on the development of that specific country, which is a little different in terms of a macro thing, like the Napoleonic Wars, it, it, they really changed the entire direction of Western history, and because of colonialism and imperialism, that changed the entire development of world history, you see? Um, but I'm, I don't consider myself a military historian, and I'm not a particular war buff anymore, certainly not more than a lot of our fans. They, they know more about the minutiae of the war than I ever did or ever will. Um, and when we're talking about minutia, what do you th history is the best? Asks, what do you think of World War One generals thinking the next war would be the same as World War One, and how that affected the development of military technology and doctrine in between the wars? Um, well, it's funny because the uh, World War generals thought World War One was going to be the same as the last wars, as the Franco-Prussian War, or, or you know, places where cavalry played such a huge decisive role, and of course it didn't really in the trench trenches of the Western Front. It did more on the Eastern Front and in, in the Middle East and stuff. Um, people get something that works 11, 12 times. People get conservative about that and think this is going to work. Like um, um, uh, Georg Bruchmüller, uh, who was definitely one of the most brilliant minds of the First World War, who was Germany's artillery wizard. Without question, the artillery genius of the first half of the 20th century. His doctrines and his thoughts about modern artillery, they guided all the German breakthroughs in the Kaiserschlacht, the German Spring Offensives, um, the, where they figured out their own combined stormtroops and artillery doctrine at, at the Battle of Riga and stuff. It was absolute genius. But during the spring offensives, after the first 12 times that the Germans were doing the same thing, it didn't work so well after that. But they had not further developed on Bruchmüller's uh, and Houtier's stormtroop tactics. They had developed to a certain point, but they did not develop beyond that certain point. So anything, no matter how genius, no matter how brilliant, if you do it 12 or 13 times to the same enemy, they might find a defense for it. Right. I don't think that quite answered his question, but I think it was a good answer anyway. It's a great answer. So so uh, I'm going to answer two questions uh, in rapid fire, actually. 
Why did Russia have the highest casualty rate in World War I and World War II? Pretty simple, actually. The Red Army uh, and before that the Imperial Army relied on the idea of uh, bodies uh, as defense. Yeah. As simple as that. They, they relied much more on numbers than they did on technology and tactics. They threw them into the war and they died as flies. Yeah, but they had, Russia had two great, great advantages. And it wasn't just the one. And these two cannot be, you cannot take them away from each other. Land. You had one without, you had endless land and endless men. And Russia had that. And that's pretty hard to beat. And, they played, and they played it. And they played it. They played it ruthlessly as yeah. well. Both, you know, burnt soil and, and whatnot. I have to watch out that I don't break the... the, um, the thing. Wait, 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 okay. wait. One more question. And that is... Since you've been living in Sweden, do you really think Sweden was neutral during World War II? Yes, there is no doubt that Sweden was neutral during World War II. As a young, uh, rebel, like rebellious and, and pissed off young man who didn't grow up in Sweden and thought that my Swedish roots sucks, or sucked, which I don't think nowadays, but I thought that when I was a young little lad, uh, I was convinced that Germany, uh, so Sweden was on the German side, and I tried to drive that home for a very long time, until I really started studying the matter. And the fact of the matter is that there is no doubt that Sweden was extremely neutral during World War II. That is, it's as simple as that. And I'm not ready to answer that yet. Um, I haven't written enough of the war to go in the depth that I've gone to say in the, say the First World War. True, like when people say, who's the greatest general of World War II? I don't know. Well, that's why I chose to answer I'm it, because gonna, it happens yeah. to be a thing that I've researched. Yeah, so, I, I yeah. don't know yet. Yeah. You can ask me about World War I and stuff, sure. Um, uh, oh, uh, somebody asked, are we going to cover the Sino-Japanese War, the second Sino-Japanese War? Because the first one is long gone. Yes, we already are. And you'll see a lot of it in the December episodes and the January episodes. Um, those episodes focus a lot on the Winter War. Finland and the Soviet Union, and the Sino-Japanese war, what was going on over there in the East. Okay. Uh, oh, there's one that's coming up a lot, Indy, uh, that's coming, been coming up over and over again. Can you recommend, and I think you would be the, the one for this, can you recommend any good World War I books, and can you recommend any good World War II books? Um, it depends what you're looking for. I can recommend a great deal of World War I books, because there's a lot of good ones. Um... If you're looking for something that doesn't so much go into the actual, oh, they brought this many guns, they did this at this battle, but really covers the macro forces and the political forces, particularly in 1917 and 1918, um, David Stevenson's stuff is fantastic. If you want a lot of side stories about the personal angle, um, Martin Gilbert has so many stories about the poets, about Vera Britton and her hospital, about the anecdotes. If you're looking for just... Mm, uh, well, I like, as, as a general ground course, uh, A World Undone is, is really, is, was really good. World War II stuff, again, I've only really gone deep, you know, I mean, I, I know the war pretty well, but only gone deep like I did in, in, uh, The Great War in the first half year. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, if you're, if you want to learn stuff about the second scene, the, what was going on in China and Japan, Ron Amitter wrote some great stuff. Uh, William Trotter's The Winter War. There's several different Winter Wars. William Trotter's The Winter War is a really good, uh, really good uh, overview of the Winter War between Finland and the Soviet Union. Uh, in terms of the actual straight up European war, I will reserve my judgment for another seven or eight months till I see how the resumption of hostilities in the West is handled by the books I'm using most deeply to go into, right? Uh, Indy, do I love the movie Pearl Harbor? Well, if by love you mean, do I hold it deeply in my heart and do I get dizzy and, and feel an affinity for it when I think of it, uh, then no. If by love do you mean avoid, then yes. Then I totally love it in that case. Okay, so we got a couple of questions from one of our... Um, uh, hey, Tony's there! Tony Steller! Hey, Tony! Tony Boboni, Banana Fana Fofoni, <laughs> Fee Fi Momoni! Tony! Tony, uh, of course, was one of, one of the a major part of the great, of the, the great, great war crew. Flo, Tony, Marcus, and Juliana. Really nice that you're here, Tony. I don't know if you were here earlier. This is, uh, you know, we've been doing this, oh God, all day, which is why we're having wine. But Tony's seen me drink a lot of wine over the years and stuff. 
Oh, I miss you guys already, you know? Gosh. Oh. Um, and uh, we have a patron who's uh, not able to join Skype, but had some questions to us. And uh, he writes, Hi, Time Goes Team. Thank you for the World War I series. I found out about your project in late 2016 and got hooked immediately. Since the World War II series is closing on the Winter War, I was wondering if you would be interested in making an episode about the Finnish Civil War at the, and the prison camps after it. It is a very dark time in Finland's history, and it is still a bit of a taboo subject here. Also, the political divide that continued after is very re relevant to the Winter War. Um, yeah, no, 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 problem, I'm not yeah. going to say it's not relevant, because of course it is, especially the feelings towards the the soviets and stuff you know with the reds and whites and stuff tony. pardon tony what do you, what do you say <laughs> ah, lots of big smiles oh good evening tony i like tony yeah. um we will not be doing a special on the finnish civil war on the world war ii channel because it doesn't fall within the scope of the channel there will be likely in late january or early february although don't quote me on that there will be times when i go backtracking to explain a little bit of the back history of the Finnish stuff before before the World War, as I did like with the like the Polish Soviet War the other week with the Stalin stuff and Tukhachevsky and stuff, um, but it will not have a special because it doesn't fall within the actual scope of the channel. And that's and unfortunately, it doesn't really fall within the scope of the Between Two Wars series either. It does go on into that period a little bit, but it's just winding down as we start. And it becomes one of those like very difficult things. Do we deal with it because it's a couple months in and whatnot? And we just had to, for sheer uh, time of of uh, or sheer sheer like ability to focus, we had to focus on the conflicts in Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus, and and the Bal the Baltic states. The well, Baltic it, states. It, it was going to be fully covered as a specials on the Great War. We did a, a Finnish special. Which ends with the December Declaration of Actual Independence, but doesn't cover the Civil War because there was going to be a part two. But then we had so many other specials to do that we never got around to doing the part two, and I'm sorry for that because that would have been very interesting. What are my thoughts about communism? I will not tell you my thoughts about communism or any other ism. What I feel, my political opinions, my political judgments can only, could only, if I aired them, negatively color this channel and people's opinions of how we present history because we try to do it without taking with taking away our feelings and our respect for specific isms what we do and don't support so i will talk about i will talk a great deal about communism over the next few years but i will be talking it to it fairly dispassionately and fairly disconnectedly instead of my uh my personal opinions about it. I did, that's the last thing I want to do is say, here's what I think, and so that's what I think of the Soviet Union. That's never going to happen. And on that vein, Indiana Jones asked if we are going to cover the struggle between Stalin and Trotsky on the Between Two Wars channel. Um, the answer is yes. We are going to do the first coverage of that in, um, in just the coming weeks. We've already recorded that episode, mm -hmm. and it was written with the help of our, our community once again. Uh, I don't remember off the bat of my head who helped us with that. Uh, oh, yeah, it was Camille. Uh, thank you, Camille, for that, if you're here. Uh, and uh, we will uh, cover that in the episode about Lenin's death and Stalin's rise to power. We'll cover the whole like you know conflict between the three of them. And I would just add one thing to Indy's uh, statement. I completely, 100% agree with what Indy said, but on top of that, I will add what I have said many times during the day today. No matter what our political opinions are, uh, and they are not relevant to this show or to anything that we do, but no matter what they are, there is one thing we do not support, and that is oppression, totalitarianism, and mass murder. From the left, from the right, from the center, from Mars, doesn't matter. Exactly. It hasn't happened from Mars yet, as far as we know. Yeah, I don't well, know Mars attacks, that. they started. Well, no, there was this thing in the 30s where... Arr, arr, arr. No, there arr, was this, arr, arr. I, I heard a radio report in the 30s about... Uh, there was a, Oh, yeah, and when Mars took over New Jersey. There was an invasion in New Jersey. Um, somebody wrote has written several times, do I wear makeup in these episodes because sometimes I look different in the episodes. Yes, they have to put some makeup on me for the lights and stuff. My skin tends to get very... It doesn't look red in real life, but on camera, because it's, it's quite thin, it looks red in real life. So they fix that in the editing, they use makeup, and if it looks different, it's because different people are editing it, and maybe I've had a haircut, or something, or maybe I haven't shaved, 
or maybe I'm really, really hungover. That we only happened once with the, in the Great War. It was some out of the trenches episodes. I had been out with Tony actually till like six in the morning the night before in Berlin. We were shooting at ten and doing the out of trenches. Go oh, God, never again. That was like the worst decision of my life to film that. So, and someone uh, has repeated many times, uh, "Would you, time goes, to ever do something on the Great Game in, Af Af in Afghanistan?" Maybe, but uh, the, it's it's outside of the scope of our current series. So at the moment we won't. But we did cover the carving up of the Middle East after the San Remo conference, or during, before, and after the San Remo conference, yeah. in an episode of Between Two Wars, where we went into some depth of how the situation in the Middle East. But even really going back today. into the eighteen hundreds and stuff. I mean, and it's so well covered in the Flashman books, which I've mentioned before, that I I, I don't know if I could do it justice like that. I don't know either. It's a very, it's a difficult one as well because it's like a very subtle and very long development that covers and it kind of like bites into five or six different uh, regional conflicts that are not in the region of Afghanistan and, and the Middle East. Um, somebody's asked if we're going to have out of the trenches style things. Yes, we think we're going to call it out of the foxholes, although we don't know. We'll be covering uh, country oh, specials. Oh, no, that's been decided. Okay, it's been decided. But we cover country specials like we do in the Great War, Italy, Austria, Tanutuva. We totally need to do a special on them. There they are, Tanutuva. Yes, there will be country specials in the Great War. Yes. Indy, can you say <coughs> hello to Valerie and happy birthday? Oh, my gosh, Valerie. I'm so sorry I forgot your birthday. But Valerie, happy, happy birthday. Here. Uh... <coughs> Dora, me too. Sparty, Valerie. Guys, everybody out there, raise a glass to Valerie. Happy, happy birthday. Happy Valerie, birthday. <coughs> Valerie shares a birthday with Conrad von Hotzendorf. Woo. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yep. Tanu, what? This country right here. Tanu Tuva. Google it. Okay. What was I saying was the greatest blunder of the Great War? Um, uh, Franz Joseph declaring war on Serbia. Well, we covered the Indochina <laughs> War. Well, you know, uh, that is one of the things that we would love to cover, actually, especially since it ties into the Korean War, and that is the the whole, like, Southeast Asian conflicts um, around or during the Cold War is something that we would love to cover Very more. Very much, yeah. But that would actually, I mean, I mean to be perfectly honest, when we were like putting together a wish list of things to do, those were above World War II. Korea was us. number one. Korea was With, Korean Without War. a doubt. And, yeah. and Indochina, I said at that point, I yeah. said I want to do Indochina because it's like, you know, Dien Bien Phu, Phu and everything that went on there has so much impact on the region and on the world still to this day. So, yeah. and it's so recent. So, you know, we, we'd love to do that. But right now we're Can doing Can you slow World the War comments II. down, Doran? Because we're getting like 55 a minute now when it was like 15 a minute. Can't? Okay, I'll just read what I can. Are you guys tired? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, we are very tired. Uh, we are now in our, what is it? We are now in our seventh, no, we are in our eighth hour of doing this today. <laughs> I can't, I, these are too fast for me to read. You need uh, to start sorting for us. Uh, your yeah, I, I can't, I can't keep up with them to read them. But we do Tano Tuva week by week. <laughs> you know, I got to admit, I think I'd really like to, but you tell me where the sources for Tano Tuva week by week that are translated into English or Swedish or some or, or German or French or some language one of us can read are. Uh, and then, yes. Is the vest a costume or your real fashion style? Um, well, the gray vest for the gray war was very much a costume. Um, this vest, this vest in these pants, this is a, it's mine. Um, it's a fashion style. No, this is what... You ever watch The Mentalist on TV? You know that show? He always wears like the no 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 tie and the vest and the jacket and stuff. Um, I wear the vest because it sort of ties World War II together with the Great War. So I do wear vests occasionally out in regular life when I'm in Stockholm. But more often than not, it will be as part of a suit because I like to wear suits when I go out. I think I look nice in a suit. <coughs> Why do you both look so stylish? <clears throat> Just lucky, I guess. What's Angry Indy like? Um, very muscular and green. <laughs> I have a picture of that. It's I true, say, actually. I have a picture of that. I can tell you what Angry Indy is like. <coughs> yeah. Angry Indy is, is, is um, 
First of all, angry angry Indy is most angry at himself more often than he's angry at somebody oh, yeah, else. Like so he gets really angry at himself. And angry Indy is is quite vocal. Yes. <laughs> Uh, this guy's asked like five or six times, will we cover the Hundred Years' War week by week? <laughs> yes. Yes. No? I no, just, no, yes no, we are. I just, <laughs> want, I just want you to think about that for a moment and to decide what my answer is. <laughs> and the answer is obviously yes. So, um, did Turkey do anything interesting in World War II? Everybody did something interesting in World War II. We're not there yet. Yeah. So, Okay. Did researching World War One ever get overwhelming for you mentally by the horrors of it? Okay, I agree with you. And asks that. Uh, not by the horrors, it by the volume of it, and that's going to happen with the Second World War, especially when you know the schedule was tight and I had to write several episodes and say, uh, uh, like I only had a week left before shooting and I had to do another three or four episodes, especially if it was like you know the summer of nineteen sixteen when you had the Somme. Brusilov Offensive, the Battle of Jutland, all at the same time. It, that could be overwhelming. The volume of information could be. The and My mother asks all the time, um, did she like the show, but she didn't understand how I could not get overwhelmed by talking about the amount of deaths um, week after week. And it's not a question of getting past it or ignoring it or being numb to it, because you don't do that. I don't think so. I didn't anyway. It's a question of accepting it and respecting it and realizing why you're doing this show in the first place. Do you, and Alec Abdakov asks, do you think the Brusilov Offensive could have won the war? Yes. Yes, I do. I think the Brusilov Offensive, I think actually the only, let's say, real, with a grain of salt, the only real chance Either side had to win the war before the war actually ended was the Brucey Love Offensive. And Brett asks, and that's a question I think you didn't know that, Brett, but that's a question for me. Have you ever been at or taken part of a reenactment? Oh, uh, I don't think you have, right? No. no. Uh, well, I have. I have actually organized big reenactments. I uh, spent... My last teenage year, from the age of 19 until the age of 24, 20, well, I think it was 25 even, um, I spent doing medieval reenactments and co-organizing the Medieval Week uh, at Visby uh, in, on the island of Gotland in Sweden. Uh, and I did it at Hova, I did it in Stockholm, I co-organized the reenactment of, tor of, of tournament games, or, or carousel games as they were called, so... I spent six years of my life um, dressed in medieval garb and doing reenactments. You should have said, I spent week. six years of my life dressed in medieval garb, and then I started doing reenactments. <laughs> 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 Which is pretty close to it. Yes. Luca Tomacic asks, uh, uh, since you have been talking about ancient history a bit, what is your opinion on Caesar and the late Roman Republic? Well, you just told your opinion of that. No, Caesar. Oh, Julius Caesar, not Caesar Augustus. Yeah. Okay, because when I hear Caesar, I think of the Caesar late Augustus. Roman Republic. Republic. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, oh, dealing with the first triumvirate and stuff. What is my opinion of it? Mm. I like the triumvirates because I think, looking back from now, it's exciting history. But I think I would have hated to be living during the times of, you know, of Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus and stuff. I think it would have been, oh, gosh, that's that's... That's tough times. That's like if you were living in England in, in, in the 1650s, you know, that's it's I'll, tough times. And, and my opinion on that, I'll throw that one right back at you. My name is Spartacus. What do you think I think of Caesar? There you go. <laughs> in that period. So, and Hallory asks, if you could time travel, which battle, front or event, would you like to go back to witness in the Great War and World War II? In the Great War... I would like to go back and see Spicer Simpson and the battle for Lake Tanganyika. <laughs> Absolutely. I would like to see him with his tattoos, dressed in his skirt, not a kilt, a skirt. He wore a skirt. And uh, just see the stunning level of his incompetence and the stunning level of what everybody had to do and to deal with. Also, I picked that one because... I would likely not be killed if I was there. If I say, oh, I'd like to see the Battle of Verdun. Really? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think I'd like to see the Battle of Verdun. Um, 
World War II? Oh, ask me again in like three or four years so I have a better idea of where I'd like to be with that. Do you have an answer to that? I do, actually. I have an answer to both of them, and it's the same answer. Armistice Day for World War Two or World War One, and Victory Day in Europe, uh, uh -huh. on actually in London uh, for World War Two. You know, maybe it's a little bit of a cop out answer, but the fact of the matter is that I think that that must have been one of the most moving moments in history of mankind. Those two dates, yeah, sure. Times Square, Victory Day in, in both Europe and Japan. Right. I mean, just candidates. I mean, how. The relief of the world must have been so amazing. It, it must yeah. have been, although it was just a short respite when we're talking about World War One. it was still, you know, such, such a moving event. Somebody's asked like a million times, are we going to do a Cold War show? We already it's, did a Cold War show. It's yeah, called did. the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we will do more. We want to do the Korean War, which is part of the Cold War. You want to do and, the space race yeah. year by year. So, so hopefully, yes, but it depends on how much support can we get, because to do these things, we need... A they take crew. money. We they take they take a crew. They take editors. They take researchers. They take support on Patreon. Um, and what while we're at it, come on, guys, keep get the word out. We're one thousand two hundred people concurrently on the on the stream right now. Get the word out so we get more people in here and get the support rolling. We need it. Will Angel and Snake make a make an appearance <coughs> on a World War Two? Um, maybe the actual actors that played Angel and Snake in the Great War belong to media crowd. We would like to get them from them. We'd probably have to buy them from them. We would like to get them from them. I very much would like to see Angel and Snake's adventures. The thing is, on the Great War Channel, their adventures weren't exactly in World War I. Their adventures took place anywhere from the 30s to the 2000s and stuff. But I would like to continue and maybe have a spin-off series, a channel of its own. Angel, Angel and Snake channel would be awesome. Gosh. And if BBC should finance a Black Adder World War II Time Ghost, cr Time Ghost crossover, of course they should. <laughs> yes. What kind of question is that? I mean, we need that right now. Oh, and a couple things. <coughs> We've said, you know, there are goals on Patreon, like if we get to a certain amount of money, if you give a certain amount of money, everything counts. Things will happen. If we do get to $15,000 a month, I will, I will jump in the freezing lake. But if we get to $20,000 a month, I will tattoo somewhere on my body. Thank you, Time Ghost patrons. I get to choose where, though. But we already said if I get to $100,000 a month, I have to tattoo uh, Luigi Cadorna on my body, which I'm really not looking forward to, and I'm not happy that I said that. So. Cosman Alexandrescu asks us, is this really the best time to live in history? What do you mean? Now, 2018. It is the best time... It is the most convenient time to find multiple and diverse sources to get a better picture of history. Uh, to, is it the best time to live in history? If you enjoy your life as you do now with technology, longer life expectancy, uh, lesser chance of having to defend your country in time of war. I mean, I'm the first generation of, in American history of Americans that knew they were not going to be called on to automatically to be conscripted to defend their country in time of war. So uh, in, in, some, in those terms, it is the best time in history. There are other periods where if, if you think certain things are better than other things, then you might rather want to live in those periods and stuff. But uh, I, this is a great time to live in history. My answer to that is an unequivocal yes. Um, I think we are the luckiest human beings ever alive. Think uh, of it this way. For all the reasons that Indy said, but on top of it, wait, just one, one okay. second. Um, on top of it, there's another thing, and that is the specifically what we are talking to each other with right now. This moment in history is the moment in history where you will have the most knowledge so far at your fingertips because of the internet, because of everything that's going on, and that is not just something that is fun because it's a mind game or anything like that. It is fueling a rapid revolution across the world towards more equality, more fairness, uh, more openness of society. And I'm not talking about some kind of leftist values here. I'm talking about the simple thing of you get to decide what you do with your life, which could be considered to be a conservative value. It's true. Like, you have, less, you you have, have you, much lesser you, things you have to do. Exactly. You have a profession. You have a class. You're born into it. You're stuck. In parts of the world, sure. Um, but you have fresh water more here. 
more and more now than you have in most parts of the world before. You have food and electricity and education more than that. You can't fault those. And the Earth is, what, four and a half billion years old? We, everybody here now, and me, we were lucky enough to be alive at the same time as David Bowie. Out of four and a half <laughs> billion years, you should you thank your lucky stars for that. That could have gone either way, you know. You're not going to win the lottery because you were alive the same time as David Bowie. Uh, why did decolonization not happen after World War One, despite weakening of Europe, unlike World War Two? Maybe you can answer uh, that. The the, the, uh, the process of decolonization uh, accelerated because. Specifically, when, when you saw, like, for example, Austria-Hungary's breakup and all the new nations in Europe and all, and women gaining the vote all over the world, people in the, say, the French or the British or whoever's colonies could not help but see this and want the empowerment of their own. It accelerated greatly. I mean, when you, especially consider with the, the stronghold of the race for Africa in the 1880s, um, we saw, and we talk about it a bit in Between Two Wars, and we'll talk a lot more about it in future episodes of Between Two Wars. You saw, certainly in Egypt, in all over the Middle East, in India, you saw a very, very quick realization that if these people have these rights, why do we not have these rights? It was not instantaneous, like the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for the simple reason that, you know, India did not suddenly lose the war and have to be ripped away from England or from Britain directly. Um, I said, I, there was a question somebody's a asked a bunch of crap and I've lost it. Will you tell more about Romania on the World War II channel? When it becomes relevant in the week-by-week -week chronology, yes. We did mention it when the Iron Guards um, did their thing in, in September. But Romania, for example, in December... I don't mention December 1939. I do not mention Romania at all. I'm too busy talking about China, Finland, the Battle of the River Platte, things like that. There is a, I'll look at questions here in a second. Uh, am I going to do a video about the Battle of Jutland? Well, yes, you are. We already did. We covered it. We covered the entire First World War week by week. If there is any battle... He means the new one. Oh, okay. I thought okay. Um, yeah, well, we're gonna, yeah, of course. So, sorry, I'm still. It's it is it's it's November 11th. So, do I have any plans for after I finish World War II? Uh, I was thinking I might drink myself into oblivion and wake up from South America somewhere, but other than that, not really. Dorm's smiling. He doesn't realize I'm absolutely serious. Uh, if I could time travel, what would I change? Ooh, that's a dangerous one. I don't want to answer that without Sparty because that goes back to the whole beginning of Time Ghost and stuff. We'll worry about that later. Um, these are really going quickly. Am I ever going to cover World War I? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> wow, you actually struck me speechless there. <laughs> Um, I have spent the last four and a half years covering World War One. There's a YouTube channel called Shut up, YouTube channel called The Great War. You can search for it uh, on YouTube, and you can hear me cover World War One week by week, exactly a hundred years later in real time, from July twenty eighth, nineteen fourteen, so far until today, nineteen eighteen. So yes. And somebody asked, are we going to cover the Long March? Yes, we are. Oh, yeah, and sure, totally. between two wars, uh, uh, obviously. What would happen if Germany won World War I? I, I? See, that's a dumb what if, okay? <laughs> because you have to rewrite so much history. I mean, a more simple what if, although there's still what ifs, and you, you can't know. But a more simple what if would be, what if the Allies had won World War I in 1916 when the Brusilov Offensive was successful? That would have been a completely different game changer. The Tsar would have still been in power. The United States never would have left its splendid isolation and joined the war or, or become the military colossus that it ended up being. being um, the imperialism and colonialism would, have, would still have stayed full force. The Kaiser still would have remained in power because nobody wanted to remove him from power. Franz Joseph was still alive the century would have looked massively different. For Germany to have won, the thing is, 
you can't say, what if Germany won the First World War? You would say, what if the Central Powers won the First World War? There were four Central Powers. You get, if Germany won the First World War, that would also mean Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire won the First World War. I see no scenario in which that could have realistically happened at any point during the First World War. I can't say what would have happened, but the idea that Germany would have won and the other three would have just sort of disappeared, that's not how, that's not how history works. You can't, it's like when you read a lot of 50s science fiction novels and they've taken one thing about human society and made it really futuristic, but everything else is still like it's 1952. That's the same thing. You can't just have Germany winning World War I. You have to have the central powers all winning the First World War. And Hi, Scott Weaver. Nice that you're joining us. I'm happy that we stayed up until you could. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's get back to what would we change uh, if we could in history. What would I change if I? Oh gosh, I don't. I don't know. If well, I'm maybe we should that. like. No, I mean, it's like it's it's a very difficult topic. It's such a difficult topic that we spent a good year of our lives actually trying to work out how we would cover that. We even shot a pilot about it and whatnot, and that is where the word. Time, the name Time Ghost comes the show, from. Yeah, we started called, um, called Time Ghost 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Eventually adopted it because of Sightguy's theory, but the, back then the idea was to create a show where Indy, playing the narrator of the show and actually the hero or the anti-hero of the show. Hieronymus Jackson. Hieronymus Jackson was his name. Uh, goes back in time and changes things, and it doesn't turn out quite as he expected. And, and then to go back and another him again. has to come back changing things to fix him because they make things worse. And so one of him is trying to hunt the other one of him. So each thinks the other's the bad guy. So they're fighting each other and stuff. It was a good idea for a show, actually. It was, but it's very complicated. Yeah. And there's been a couple of shows since then that have been in that <coughs> vein that are not bad because the fact of the matter is that changing history. I mean, not. I mean, notwithstanding simple things like the grandfather complex of you know I became my own father and whatnot. Um, Changing history is not, and all, I, I frown a little bit on the whole alternate history scenario simply because of that. Like Indy just said, when the Central Powers win, so many things happen. It gets so complex that it's almost impossible to make something sensible with it. And that's why we chose, when we were working on the Time Ghost uh, show that we wanted to do back then, we chose to... Uh, look at it out of the perspective of all of the dozens or hundreds of or maybe even thousands of potential outcomes that could come from changing history yeah because there's just so many it, it, you know it's chaos theory at the end of the day a little thing happens in Afghanistan and the whole world goes pear-shaped it's as, yeah. it's as simple as that it's not history is not a, a, a very simple thing um, and, and 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 you know while it's it's fun to watch alternate history shows and stuff, the idea that you can realistically predict alternate history is is ludicrous. You can't. You you can't say who would have become major figures had the Brusilov offensive been successful enough to to break the back of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you can't. Here is mean, a great one from one of our patrons, uh, Tuomo Boyka. Tuomo asks Boyka. Us, he asks, "Do you guys think CV's Pachim?" Barapellum, bellum is a reasonable way of thinking. That is to say, does preparing for war actually help to avoid it? Uh huh. That's a really good question. Um, without having thought about it much, I would. Historically, I don't think so. Um, particularly, like if there's been many recent wars, like after the First World Wars and, and, and all of the small wars of the 20s and the colonial wars and stuff, still, most of the nations that won the Second World War were totally unprepared for the Second World War. They didn't have, Britain and France didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the men when, when the war started and stuff. Uh, that certainly didn't prevent the war. Does building up for the war, I think it would make a lot more sense when you go back more than say 300 or 400 years. If you are able to equip and provide for a large standing army in say 500 BC, but you're not interested so much in expanding your territory, I mean, you look at the Spartans and stuff, yeah, you, yeah then, then I think, yes, you would be preventing wars. However, if those people are constantly training for war, at some point, somebody's gonna say, why don't we have this war that we're all training for? 
I don't really know the answer to that. What do you say? I, I come back to the question we got a couple of hours ago, which was what's the most overlooked period in history, in your opinion? And I answered uh, the Roman peace. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think that here is a perfect example of where we can learn something from Augustus. Um, yes, Augustus fought wars, and he was prepared to fight those wars, but as soon as he had fought them, he went down a completely different line of, of, of action. Um, he created trade unions. He traded, created economic dependency with what had been Rome's enemies before that. So the best way to build peace is to build prosperity and build codependency. Um, this is the idea behind the European Union. It is the idea behind the United States of America, especially after the Civil War. Um, I think before that it might not have been a conscious idea, but it was an idea in there. The rift that was created between, between the South and the North created the need to create that kind of... because. Well, having said that, it wasn't really till the 20th century that the United States prepared for war, but or but either hoped for or didn't hope for, depending who you believe. Peace. I mean, when the U.S. joined uh, the First World War, when, when declared war in April 1917, the United States of America had the 19th largest army in the world. Absolutely. That's but I mean, think about that in the out of this perspective. They did that because they didn't see themselves as having a choice. Oh, no, I, I understand that. Because they were that, faced with, with a lot of... But if you look at creating peace, I mean, uh, let's... Let's take the Civil War as an example. Uh, one of the reasons why the South and the North fell out was because they were driven differently financially. The South was an agrarian, slave-based economy, and the North was more becoming more an industrial, industrial sure. uh, you know, economy depending on foreign trade. So, you know, uh, or sorry, depending on, on isolationism. So the South was depending on foreign trade because they were yeah. in a cultural, and the uh, North was depending on isolationism. And that pitted them against each other. If they would have co been codependent in a bigger way, they would never have gone to war with each but other. They weren't. But then again, we're exactly, not covering the Civil War. So. No, I know that. But I'm saying generally the question, does preparing for war uh, uh, bring peace? And my answer to that is I don't think so. I think creating economic dependency Brings peace. Brings peace. Uh, I'm going to, somebody's written something in that I'm going to let you answer while I use the gentleman's lounge. Wonderful. Um, he asked, do you think it's possible that Hitler survived the bunker? You answered that this morning. You can answer that I again. I will ha be happy to answer it again. I'm going to let you out. Yeah, I can get out here. No, can you? Yeah, if I step Great. over. Okay. Um, so then I'll get back there. Right. Okay, fine. Um, did Hitler survive the bunker? No, he did not. There is no question, and there is no reason to question that. On uh, the last day of April, Hitler shot himself in the head uh, after possibly biting down on the cyanide capsule. We don't know if he really bit the cyanide capsule before he shot himself in the head or if it ended up not happening. He had also shot his two dogs, Blondie and Wolfie, uh, and he uh, shot his then recently uh, wedded wife, um, Eva Brown, uh, after she had definitely bitten down a cyanide capsule. They were taken outside. They were under the uh, auspices of, of Bormann. They tried to burn the corpses. Uh, they only had one tank of gasoline, so they didn't do a very good job out of it. There was still a lot of dog, dog, Hitler, and Brown left. Um, and then the advancing Red Army and the chaos that was going on wouldn't allow them to go any further, although they did try. They put a couple of tires on them. These are facts that are well documented by eyewitnesses and supported with what happened when Smirsch, the Russian agent Smirsch, found Hitler um, uh, and Eva Brown and the two dogs uh, in a bomb crater where they had tried to burn them uh, a couple of days later. I think on the 1st of May already, or in the second, I can't, I can't remember which day it was, the first or second of May. They were promptly taken away in order to be identified if it was really truly Hitler, as they su suspected. They were taken to the army barracks of the Red Army outside of Berlin, where on the 8th of May, the day of uh, victory in Europe, they were, uh, they carried through a, a, a proper post-mortem. Uh, they took blood samples, tissue samples, and they kept a piece of the jaw of what they 
determined to be Hitler and a piece of his skull where the bullet had exited. Uh, these, uh, this piece of the jaw, or all of his actually dentures, were compared to the dentures that they had on record from his dentist, who had been provided by his uh, dentist, the dental assistant, uh, who had been captured by the Allies, the Western Allies, actually, and they'd gotten those in order to, to identify Hitler. Later on, they were taken to Russia, these pieces, and they the revisionists have cast some doubt on that based on that they say that the skull must have belonged to a female. That might be true, but there's no question about the dentures. So we've already concluded that. Then they were buried in a couple of ammunition crates uh, in said... Um, in, in said army barracks. Uh, a few years later, if I remember correctly, it was 47 or 48, I don't know off the top of my head, they were transported to Magdeburg where they were reburied together with the entire Goebbels family, Magda Goebbels, Josef Goebbels, and their six children in the army barracks inside of Magdeburg where they remained until 1971 when Andropov, then head of the KGB, decided to exhume the bodies um, all of them, and have them re-cremated, and uh, that is correct, what David von Kettering said, uh, he did poison at least one of his dogs to test the poison sufficiency, the, po the dogs were also, um, um, they carried out a, um, a post-mortem on the dogs and found cyanide in them, but in 1971, they were then dug out, they were cremated, they were uh, then dumped into a river in the vicinity of Magdeburg, I forget the name, uh, and that was that. All of this is well documented. There is no question to believe that it went in any other way. The reason why people believe that it was not so is that Stalin decided to muddy the waters in the weeks after this discovery. It was a personal decision by Stalin that was based on that he did not want. I mean, he was wise to this because he knew how to create a cult of personality post somebody's death after what he'd done with Lenin. He did not want the not remaining Nazis or anybody else can, to create a cult of death around Stalin or sorry around Hitler. So he purposefully spread the, spread the rumor that Hitler had escaped and was alive. He didn't even inform the Allies until a couple of weeks. I think it was like two weeks later, like 15th or 16th of May. He informed the Western Allies that Hitler had been found dead, but he never provided any evidence. So it all remained very very confusing until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, when all of these documents and all of the things that I just talked about came to light, and uh, we saw all of the evidence. There is no reason to doubt that Hitler died in the bunker the last day of April, his birthday, and the last day of real war between Germany and the Allies. Okay. Um, somebody just wrote, uh, what would have happened had the German spring offensive been successful? They were successful. You don't understand. The German spring offensive in 1918 were tactically brilliant. Tactically, they achieved everything they were supposed to achieve. Uh, strategically, there were flaws because they didn't have any group goals, but operationally, there was no overall goal. It wasn't just, oh, had they, say, had Ludendorff really focused on splitting the French and the British, and driving the British off the continent. They could have done that. I think they could have. That still wouldn't have ended the war. The Americans who were coming to France would have just been diverted to Britain and trained there like they did in the Second World War. But Ludendorff's operational goals were nothing. It was because even he said, oh, on the Eastern Front, because of course he was in charge of Eastern Front stuff with Hindenburg for several years before they became Chief of Staff and Quartermaster General. So on the Eastern Front, we just attacked, we made the breakthrough, and we just saw what happened next. It was successful. <clears throat> it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Great tactical stuff and some strategic gains and no operational gains, which was exactly what happened on the Eastern Front as well. You know? And here's a completely off-tangent thing. Sampat uh, is on the on the chat. Hi, Sampat. Hey, Sampat. So glad to see you. Sampat. Everybody say hello to Sampat. He's the guy who makes sure that we have the TV website and whatnot. He does all of our IT stuff. And he's working on getting the whole like synchronization between Patreon and whatnot working. Without Sampat, we wouldn't be as far as we are That's today. True. So really happy to have you there. Have you here? Glad you're watching. Yeah. I'm not going to answer your question though because you know the answer. But anyway, uh, Ted H asks you, Indy, what's your favorite place for wine in Berlin? 
Anne Berlin. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, it's interesting because I, um, when I'm out in Berlin, when we've been shooting the Great War and stuff, you know, being from Texas, I tend to like uh, steaks and beef and things like that. And there's a place called Wilson's. It's in an American hotel um, over in, in the in the in the west of the city. Um, it's the only place in Germany that does proper prime rib. You know, where where they'll roast the entire tenderloin at once. And they have some really nice wines to go with the prime rib. Now, I've been there twice. The first time there because I melted because I hadn't had good prime rib in, God, a long time. And then when you're in Berlin, go to Wilson's. They It used to be, it looked uh, like two years ago, it looked like a traditional stuffy hotel restaurant just happened to have prime rib. A brilliant place. But I went there earlier this year. And it's turned, it looks like it's a cool hipster place. I'm like, oh my God, they're not going to have the prime rib. But they still have the prime rib. It's still the only place in Germany with prime rib. And um, I ordered the prime rib. I ordered, I guess it's like 350 grams of prime rib. And I ordered a, a heavy cab from California to go with it. Because uh, they do have some really good wines. And the guy said, oh, okay, do you want any vegetables? And I'm like, no, I, no. Like, would, do you want any sauce? I'm like, Oh, if it's good prime rib, why would I want vegetables or sauce with a fantastic cut of meat? I wanted my, my prime rib and I wanted my wine. That's about it. I would recommend going to Wilson's though. That was it's, In spite of the fact that I'm not overly enthused with the new decor, you cannot beat. You cannot beat proper prime rib. And it's something that rarely exists in Europe in general. Uh, somebody flashed by that someone, I don't know, who doubts the evidence of Hitler's, I don't really, I, I'm just, I'm going to become a little bit edgy on that. I don't give a flaming F who doubts if Hitler was killed or killed himself in the bunker. There is overwhelming evidence and everything else is just a waste of time. Leave it and walk away from it. It's history channel crap. It's not worth your time. Um... Now, will you travel to historical locations on the World War II channel? Absolutely. As soon as we have the resources yep. and the support, we will do that. You guys give us more money on Patreon, we'll go anywhere in the world. We want to go to the Pacific. We want to go to North Africa. We want to go to the Caucasus. Western Europe and Southern Europe are a lot easier and stuff, but we want to go to all of these places. Sure. And uh, a personal question to both of us. Yep. What sports, except for baseball in your case, do you follow or practice? Well, it's not just following baseball. I play baseball. I play with a Division One Swedish team with Enquede. Uh I was a 50-year-old rookie last year, actually. It's the first time I've played on an organized baseball team since I was 15, 16. It was great. Um, that's, all, that's, that's all I actually play now. I, I mean, I, you know, I go to the gym, but, you know. And I am an avid skier. I've been skiing since I was two years old, and I used to do competition skiing in my teens. I was never at the top of the game, so I didn't make it into the like real fifth circuit, but I was pretty good, or I am still pretty good. You used good. to fence, right? I used to fence. It's just like Patton. And, and uh, I used to fence. I used to also do medieval sword fighting. He did fencing, roofing, the whole thing. <laughs> I did not do roofing. Okay. And, uh, and I'm a huge ice hockey fan. That's my, that's like my, I'm, I'm, at the end of the day, those are my Swedish roots. And it's the only time I root for the Swedish team. At the World Cup in football, I root for Germany. But when it comes to ice hockey, I'm so so Swedish, it doesn't get well, it's, it's funny because I root for Sweden in, in the World Cup in ice hockey, but the World Cup in football, I root for Mexico. <laughs> no, really. I know you're rooting for Mexico. I, you, you know, I, I'm crazy about the Mexican <laughs> so, football team. They're so awesome. next question, history question. Do you have a historical role model? Someone that I pattern my life after. I don't think so. Uh, maybe accidentally. I don't know. Um, Benjamin Bailey, the Sharks. What? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it, it's something, and it's something that actually runs several generations in my family. Uh, I didn't realize that I was doing it until I was in my thirties and forties. I'm fifty-one now. Um, that. What I've done for a living most of my adult life is come up with something that I really want to do for a living and then try to convince someone to pay me to do that. And looking back, my father and, and both of my grandfathers actually did that, even you know worlds away and stuff, in a general way and in an earlier generation way. I don't call them historical role models because we're very, very different and stuff. But in that respect, sure. 
Um, I don't know. Do you have someone you, you pattern your life after or try to No, I don't after? have somebody that I pattern my but I have a historical hero that I I at least like in our work, I, I think a lot of him and he wouldn't be a historical figure if it wouldn't have been for World War Two, and that's coming back to Mark Bloch, who is a historian, but because he fought in the resistance and was killed by the Nazis, yeah. became a historical figure as well. So but it's not I wouldn't call it a role model, but it's somebody I think a lot about when we do our work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you think that Hitler was influenced by Napoleon during the Second World War? <laughs> Indy? Oh, I thought you were going to take that one. You were, no, laughing. I, you were I, laughing so hard. I thought, I, well, because I thought I, I was gonna... I'm kind of like, yeah, well. Um, in ways, he could not help but be influenced by uh, Napoleon. But during the Napoleonic Wars, you know, the, the concept of an army marches on its stomach Really, that was where that became a modern thing. Canned foods were first really used en masse by the Napoleonic armies. So they could travel a lot further, a lot quicker, because they had preserved food and stuff. And I guarantee that Hitler's armies used those things as well. Um, in terms of Napoleonic... Nah, I can't see it. Not, not in terms of the general tactics. It was too far, too long ago. I've never read particularly that... Hitler was, oh, I, see, I really aspire to be Napoleon. I never never read that. So. so somebody asked, how hot is the studio? You look a little bit red in the face. Well, the question is, how hot are we? But yes, the studio is hot by now, and we've been doing this for, we're coming up on six hours. No, oh, we're coming up on eight hours. Let me, well, uh, over a 12-hour period. Yeah. Let me answer this one. Somebody said, have you ever missed deadlines? Um, <laughs> and if you look at just the time goes thing, uh, World War Two and Between Two Wars, and the World Dictionary and the Cuba Crisis, uh, me, no, him, <laughs> yes, many times. It's true. Well, it is true. <laughs> I'm not protesting. I take on, I have a tendency to really just say yes to too many things. Yes. So, so you are the most time optimistic human being. <laughs> and then we'll be like, okay, we'll do this. And we'll start doing Korea and we'll keep doing, I'm like, before next week? Yeah, before next week. No problem. And you can see Astrid just going like this. So, yeah, I've never met a time optimist as much as you. But now we know. So. Well, hey, it gets things done. <laughs> so, um, what do you think of the History Channel? Um, it'd be cool if it talked about history. Uh, it does talk about history. It just does, it does, It's very much pop history, and I understand that because the advertisers that advertise there... I don't think if, if it was really proper, um, non, let's say, non-sensationalized, non-pop, non-American biased history, they wouldn't have nearly the viewership, and it is, after all, a money-making proposition. That's what it exists for. This does not exist as a money-making proposition. This has to provide us with a living so that we can do it, but we're not going to be millionaires from this. Nobody's going to be. We do this because we enjoy doing this, so we can take more liberties with being less pop and less nationally, you know, biased. What is your view on Maréchal Patin and what he did? Well, Patin is actually, we, we discussed this over dinner, actually, um, and funnily enough. Well, not funnily enough. It's in the news right now, so it's kind of obvious to do that. You know, he, it's one of those typical examples of what we talked about earlier today. Somebody asked us, what about Stalin's mass murder? What about Hitler's mass murder? What about all of the deaths caused by Churchill and whatnot? It just... You know, from our perspective in 2018, there is no way that you can justify mass murder. From the perspective of the time that people lived in, things might look different. We don't want to pass judgment on that. But there is one thing that I think goes back at least to the time of, of throughout the 20th century, that the idea that you save millions of lives and therefore sacrifice other lives is not an acceptable one. And Marshal Patin might have been a great general at the end of World War One, Pioneering the combined doctrine that made. And here's something I'm going to say that I think is absolutely true, and it's really because of Patin. In the, a hundred years ago today, when the First World War ended in the field, the most modern, most effective, uh, best military force in the history of the world was the French army. You heard me say that. And a lot of the... Patton is responsible for the second reorganization of it after Nivelle. Having said that, Patton also went ahead and created the Vichy government and committed, um, a tr or was the, at least the silent partner, if not the active partner, 
to the murder of hundreds of thousands of people, together with the Nazis, for which he was, after the war, found guilty and condemned to death, because of what Indy just said, his life was spared, and he died in prison. I think that speaks volumes to what we just said. I mean, that's the best way of dealing with it. There's no way that I'm going to sit here and pass judgment on Patan as a character. His actions speak for themselves. If you think that it was a good idea to advance the Allied cause in 1918 and actually put an end to the war, well, then he did good there. If you think that it is a bad thing, as you probably should, that he sent a lot of people to their deaths in the uh, extermination camps, well, then that should be valued in the greater concept of who Patin was. And therefore, he's a very difficult character because he's a character of the 20th century where you can only say he did terrible things, he did some things that by some people would judge to be good, but all of them included the death of the death hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And that makes it very, very difficult to do what Macron did the other day and stand up and give, a, you know, give him a black but, check. But, but again, it was 100 years since since November 11th. And Patton, there's no, no question he was a great hero. That's November why I'm saying 11th, it's very difficult because it creates so. controversy because you have this one yeah. Patton in, in 1918 and you have another Patton in 1945. Yeah. What do you do with that? Well, uh, from our perspective, you don't do anything with it. You just tell the story as it is. Uh, I got to answer two questions that have come up like a bunch of times. Why is my head so large in relation to my body? That is genetic. <laughs> well, it's not like I do exercises that make my, oh, I'm going to stretch my head. Joram actually helps me with those. No, it is completely <laughs> genetic. If my head is freakishly large in relation to my body, then you'll have to go back and blame a bunch of Homo erectus and Australopithecus a long, long time ago. And the other question, will we have fan meetings? Yes, we will have fan meetings. Um, and here's one. Uh, uh, I heard from someone that you will have a fan meeting in the Netherlands. Can you tell us more about that? This is the first time we hear about it. <laughs> have you been talking about it? Um, we probably will have a fan meeting in the Netherlands when we go to the Netherlands at some point. We don't have any plans yet to go on the road, although we would like to, as I've said, go at least four or five times a year to different parts of the world and film on location. We don't have the, the money yet. We need to, once the Patreon gets bigger, once we start getting to 15,000, 16,000 a month, then we'll be able to go on the road. I mean, we have to bring film stuff on the road. We have to organize things with the local experts. We have to deal with extra editors. And when we go on the road, we will have fan meetings in every single place we go. Absolutely. And Runa Weber Hartwig, hi Runa, who helped write yesterday's episode right. of uh, Between Two Wars, asks, uh, happy to have you here, Runa. When will the next Between Two Wars episode be out? I'm not going to wise from what Indy just said that I'm the biggest time optimist in the world. Yeah, so he's going to say, uh, like, tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to refuse to answer that question and only say, as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's a few. We've shot a few more, actually, in, in August. So there's a few more to come that only need editing. So that's okay. And Dan Grant asking this one for you. If you guys were in World War One. Which general would you most like to have as a commander? Okay, that's going to be a little tricky. I know, I know you want a general answer, but I have to think, am I most often on defense? Am I most often on offense? What sort of... Am I a general of a enormous force, like, like am I like Foster Patton that has the entire French army, or am I someone like Arthur Curry? It has the Canadian force, which was a brilliantly effective fighting force, but is a more limited force. If I have a more limited force, I would want to have Curry or Monash. Having said that, if I had a larger force, a major force, I would more likely want to have Brusilov or Mackinson. And that's my answer. I don't have an answer to that, except that I'll agree with Indy about Mackinson. Because I just love like the way the hat, he looks. Man. Man, <laughs> no, I, I love the mustache. I love the look. He look, and he's got like resting bitch face, just like me. So oh, yeah. it's like there's, there's, uh, that's a thing, by the way, resting bitch face. So we're coming up on the end of this stream. We have another seven minutes. Okay. Uh, is there right. anything that? Uh, Even personal questions. That's fine. So uh, you guys, well, you got about my freakishly large head. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Uh, which war theater would I like to be commander in? I asked that. 
uh, the Lake Tanganyika, because there was the least action there. Who caused the Rice Sox fire? We will never know. Uh, gosh, these are going really fast. Uh, my apologies. But where did you get the map? This is a this is the American service. I thought it was forty three. You said forty four. The American yeah. so, service map printed forty four. It's from forty three, but yeah. Okay. It's the American service map from nineteen forty four. Pretty good. Um, that's why certain places like uh, uh, well, you see uh, Ireland. Uh, looks a bit, yeah, Ireland's still pink. I should shouldn't be. Um, Knights and, Harmony. This is going to be this is going to be our our two last questions. Okay. Or, um, is there two questions in one? Wait, let me ask them. Oh, no, no. Will you do this again? Yeah. Yes, we will. Probably not a whole 12-hour day, but maybe every time when I come down here, we can do a two- or three-hour stream just to talk about stuff like this with you guys because it's fun. And time it, time it later in the evening like now when, when people are up in most places. will accept sorry in the East, but, you know. Um, before we answer, the last question of the day is how did you two meet? Um, because we promised that we would answer yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we're going to answer, uh, I'm going to answer what you can expect on, Warner, on the War in Humanity series. And Indy is going to answer what the most, what locations you hope, wh which ones you look forward the most to go to, if you can. Sure. Right? Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about this. and We haven't set this in stone. I haven't discussed it with Indy yet. So I'm really thinking off the top of my head here. Uh, just so you understand, I will, because Indy will be focusing on the actual War series. Once I'm done with Between Two Wars, I'm going to start writing war, the War on Humanity series. It's also one of my speciality fields, so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the way that I'm looking at it right now, I thought originally that we would do it as a week-by-week -week thing. Uh, I don't want to do that because these episodes are so heavy to digest yeah. that it's too tough to do it on a week-by-week -week basis. I just don't think that that would do the subject matter service. So what I'm thinking about now is to do a couple of recaps of the months that have gone by when we start, largely covered anyway by Indy, so they don't have to be so long. Mm -hmm. And then moving into, and this is going to be time probably uh, around the Katyn Massacre, because things start taking off from there in March, April next year. Yeah. Um, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to cover it probably, again, haven't discussed this with Indy and Astrid yet, so... Uh, but probably it's going to be a monthly show, and it's going to be a monthly show that is a little longer. So it's like going to be a 20-minute episode on what happened in that month. And very much focused on the driving ideas and ideology behind what happens. Okay. Because that is the part that we cannot cover in the regular episodes. Right, right. It's really easy to cover... Like, you know, this happened, this happened, happened, that, happened, happened, happened that happened, happened that happened, that happened. What we never get into, I'll give you an example. We, we've we talked a lot about how teachers and academics and whatnot were killed in Poland in the last couple of weeks because they were en masse, unfortunately, a terrible thing. But we've never had the opportunity in the actual regular episodes to explain why the Germans did that. And this is not speculation. This is easily documented because the Germans wrote it down. I mean, they, they have the, they have the, the yeah. records for it. And the answer to that is they wanted to kill any possibility of resistance. But just answering it like that is not sufficient. You need to, to explain the whole ideology behind it. So that is what I want to use the War Against Humanity for, to explain the underlying ideas, why they did these things. Not in a way uh, to create an, apology, uh, an uh, like apologism or, or explanations no, for no, it, yeah. but to create more understanding for how the different movements went and why people did this. And of course, what you can also expect is a com no hold back. I, I'm not going to hold back from talking about what was done to the British population when it comes to their civil rights when the war broke out, or what was done during the carpet bombing of Germany, or how terrible the Holocaust was, or the Japanese internment in the United States. I will give you the full view of what everybody did, which was not cool. Yeah. Because this is largely what the, at least philosophical part of the war is about. Two different kinds of, of way of handling humanity that uh, are pitted against each other. On one side, the ends justify the means, and on the other side, no, there is a strict, definite, ethical, moral value that we cannot cross. One of the proponents of that was Roosevelt, for instance, who, who fought many of the things the Allies did. 
and Eleanor Roosevelt, after the war, turned that into the United Nations. So this is a typical like example of some of the things that we learned from World War II and where there were different sides. That doesn't mean that the Americans did not commit war crimes. It just means that Roosevelt was one of the guys who was thinking in that way during this time. And, and so that needs to be explained. It's going to be a good series. Yeah. And, and, um, and your question to remind you was, what is the favorite location, or what, would, what are your dream locations that you want to visit? Um, the, for World War II, the North African Front, because my grandfather fought there. Um, definitely uh, places around like Changsha and like the South Central China, where, you know, like where the Japanese did manage to cut like the supply routes, but the Chinese still managed to hold uh, uh, there. I, I just think that's fascinating. The smaller points. I've been writing so much about the Winter War, all this stuff in December, the, like going to up, going to like Taipale uh, and Lake Laodoga. And stuff would be really interesting for me at the moment, even though these are things that they're probably going to be peripheral. They're not going to be priority visits uh, for us. Having said that, when the Great War had finally raised enough money in 2016 that we could start going once in a while on the road, we asked the audience, we asked you guys, where did you want us to go first? And we thought people were going to say Verdun or the Isonzo River or Gallipoli or the Somme. No, no, no. It was an over, overwhelming Pshemishl. It was. and Really, it was. It was like 75%. Because I talked about Pshemishl for how many weeks and stuff. And we're like, all right, cool. If that's what if that's what you guys want, then... And that's where we went. And I and it was, it was amazing going there. And once you've seen, like, that fortress town and the, you know, Solis Soglio and the whole ring of forts, you know... 15 kilometers away and the main point where you can see for over 100 kilometers in every single direction there you understand what a fortress town really means you know it was um and the earthworks around like the local the the the, the fort the ring of forts around the city that um that support each other it's just you'd have to be the russians to attack that without lots of artillery, because it is an absolute killing zone any way you look at it. There's some trees now. There were no trees. They took down all the trees then, you know. And it was, um, yeah, that was a real eye-opener. So maybe that's what's going to happen here. And we're going to ask you guys, now we've raised enough money on Patreon that we can afford to go somewhere. Where do you want us to go? And you're going to pick somewhere that I totally did not expect. So... Yeah. Okay, so the final answer. Sorry, I know we're getting some really great questions uh, from you, you here, and and uh, to the ones of you here who, who are patrons and that are writing in and telling us that, man, you know, you guys rock. You're the reason we're here. You're the yeah. the the, uh, the the basis of everything that we do. We've said it many times during the day today. There's no way that we can finance this show based on advertisement or it's uh, or, it. or, or, or sponsorships or anything alone. We need the support that we get on Patreon and TimeGhost.tv, and we need it in order to be able to continue, expand, and do better things. And you are absolutely invaluable to this effort. You are just mm -hmm. as invaluable as 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 we are, uh, or as India is. Uh, without you, we would not be here. So that that is that. Now we're gonna answer the the last. We we put Let this up in the first. Yeah, Indy's gonna do it. How uh, did Sparty and I first meet? Now I'm gonna say it in a sentence, and then I'm gonna have to explain. Now the sentence. At first, you're gonna say, "Come on, bullshit." That sounds like a line from a bad Hemingway novel, but I guarantee it is absolutely 100% true. I met Sparty in a Mallorcan whorehouse over the Millennium Shift. It's true. That it's is the truth. actually where we met. Um, I had some friends that were going. They, they, uh, somebody's relative had a, a house in Mallorca, so we went down over the Millennium Shift, over the change from 1999 to 2000. And yes, I know that's not the real Millennium, but still. Um, and I went down with them, and Sparty was also friends with them. We'd never met each other before, and we got there like the 29th or the 30th. And I had, a, yes, I did just say bullshit. Now I've said it twice. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I, we'd said hi and we talked a bit, but uh, over the actual millennium thing, some of these people, there was, what was the place called? Uh, the American Table Dance. But it wasn't just a strip club. It was a strip club plus, I guess. 
Uh, it I had, was a, it was it was plain and simple a, a, a whorehouse. It was. Yeah. Uh, I had no particular interest in what was for sale. Uh, that that's just not my bag, and neither did Sparty. So, but our friends were there. So we had to kill a few hours at the bar. So we just. We started talking to each other, and that's when we made our first plans for, really, we started talking about history straight off the bat, and I started talking about doing historical stuff, and then he was living in Munich, and I was living in Stockholm. It was only, like, a few months after that that I came down to Munich to, to, to start. That's when we started really, really wor working, the, working this kind of stuff, but actually, we did meet. We became friends in a Mallorcan whorehouse over the millennium shift. If you are the next Ernest Hemingway, you can totally use that line in your next book. And no, we did not meet in the Blue Oyster Bar, as like 10 people wrote earlier. You know that's only in a movie, right? You do know that's and, just a movie. And we were in Police Academy 9, yes. <laughs> yes, but we did not meet at the Blue Oyster Bar. Okay. The American Table Dance in Munich is not called the American Table Dance in Munich. It's called the New York Table Dance in Munich. Ah, okay. We were at the American Table Dance in Munich uh, outside of... Uh, 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 Palma de Mallorca in, in, in Mallorca and, and no we did not meet over a whore and we did not need to lock eyes because we were at the bar. We were at the bar. And, I wasn't making had, up, why would I make this stuff up? Look I'm pretty open about my past. People you know I'm, that's And if fine. we would have been whoring we would have admitted it uh, right now right here but we weren't. That's just the way it was. So yeah, uh, yeah it, okay fine we admit it's a cover story for the Oyster Bar. Oh, God. Oh, to distract you from that, as we turn everything off, I will, without any explanation, I will answer one more question. What do I think is the most influential battle of the 20th century? The Battle of Warsaw in the Polish-Soviet War. What do you think of that? Which we covered yeah. in between two wars. <laughs> yeah. And with that, we wish you all a good day and a good night, depending on where you are in the world. Good night we and good luck. And we thank you for being with us all of this time. And support us on Patreon. We can't say that enough, obviously. And these are my hands. <laughs>